marriage is not the source of happiness. Now, is marriage good and right? Sure. Is marriage God's plan for most people? Sure. Is there great joy and blessing in a God-centered marriage? Yes. But does that mean it's the source of our happiness? No. Because of sin, we have, as I said, relationship issues. Because of sin, we have issues in our homes. We have issues in our workplaces. And you know what? Even because of sin, we have issues and problems in our churches. But God is our strength. God is our guide. And through the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, we have victory over those issues. That's why we have the cross. At the cross, sin was defeated. At the cross, lies were crushed. The problem comes in, though, when we allow ourselves to re-embrace those lies. Um, lies bombard us every day. So far in this series, Lies Christians Believe, we have talked about basically the basis of having right thinking and Bible-guided thinking. We have discussed lies that Christians can believe even about God. Then in our next session, we discussed lies that Christians believe about man or self. And last time we were together, we had a good, a good time together just learning what God has to say about the truth about sin because we often embrace lies about sin. Now tonight, you've got your notes there at your seat. We're going to be taking a look at some lies that obstruct or get in the way of God's plan for marriage. You see, God has a plan for marriage because God invented marriage. God has the blueprints laid out for marriage because marriage was his idea. Marriage came from God. Marriage did not come from man. Um, recently, I, I understand where this, this person was coming from, but I saw a a, a leader post online, a, a spiritual leader post online about uh, marriage in the secular world, and, and he had made a passing comment that, that marriage is secular by nature or something to that effect, and, and I, have to, I have to disagree with that because marriage was, in, was created by God. God gave us marriage. Now, does the secular world embrace Civil marriage, uh, absolutely, okay, and, and I get that. There, there are laws in our countries, uh, our countries and other countries uh, surrounding the, the, the civil union uh, that they call marriage, but the coming together of man and woman was originally uh, given to us by God. And so if marriage originates with God, then why don't we go back and read about the very first marriage? Can we do that? I've got the notes in your notes, uh, the passage listed out. If you'd like to read it from your copy of the scriptures, or you're welcome to do so as well. Or I think it'll be up here on the screen, uh, anywhere that it's most helpful for you. I want to take a look at the first marriage instituted by God. And we find this in Genesis chapter 2, starting in, I believe, verse 18. And it says this, The Lord God said, It is not good... That the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he, that's God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone, apparently he had woken up at this point. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, 
shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. There we have a description of the first marriage. If you cannot see God's hand all over the very first marriage, then one must be blind, right? Because God physically put Adam to sleep, opened him up, took a rib, closed him back up, made woman out of the rib, brought these two together. Man shall leave father and mother. Now, that was a biblical principle. There was no father and mother at this point with Adam and Eve, but it's a principle. Man shall leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There we have the picture-perfect first marriage. Then something happened. Marriage was attacked. You say, wasn't more than marriage attacked? Well, yes. Um, God was attacked. Human, the human race was attacked. Um, and the human race failed. Man failed. But what I want to point out to you tonight is that it was the institution of marriage that God invented that Satan used to wreak so much havoc upon mankind. He used deception within the marriage. I want to read for you a little excerpt out of, the, out of one of the books that we're using for this study. Um, remember, we're using uh, two books for this study written by a, a couple. They're now married. They were not married when the first book was written, but it's, it's, their last name was Wolgamuth. Uh, it's Nancy DeMoss uh, Wolgamuth, and who used to be Nancy Lee DeMoss. You may, may be familiar with that name. Or uh, hers, her, bleh, bleh, bleh. Her husband, uh, Robert um, Wolgamuth. Anyway, in Lies Women Believe, the, which is one of the, the books, I want to read for you an excerpt that kind of describes the destruction that entered into that first marriage and thus mankind. It says this, What took place in the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago was not only an attack on God and on two people, it was an attack on marriage. Marriage was designed by God to reflect his glory and his redemptive purposes. In undermining that sacred institution, Satan struck a forceful blow at God's eternal plan. It is no coincidence that Satan launched his insidious plan by approaching a married woman. He lied to her about God, about his character, God's character, and his word or God's word. And he lied about sin and its consequences. She believed and acted on this lie and then turned to her husband and drew him in to sin with her. Mind you, he chose to sin. We're not implicating uh, Eve for Adam's sin here, but I just want to point that out there. Um, the implications in their marriage, though, were profound. Shame replaced freedom. Pretense and hiding replaced transparency and fellowship. The oneness that Eve and her husband had uh, experienced in their original state had now turned to enmity and animosity, not only toward God, but now toward one another. You remember the blame game they played? Oh, well, well, it's his fault. It's her fault. It's, it's the snake's fault. It's your fault, God. And this blame game went back and forth after, after the, the fall to the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Instead of providing loving leadership for his wife, the man was now prone, and when he says man, I think he's talking about man through the ages now, uh, man was now prone to extremes, ranging from domineering control to passive detachment. The protection the woman had been granted under her spiritual head was removed, and the independent spirit she had exerted toward God, now displayed itself toward her husband, leaving her vulnerable to greater deception, sin, and attack. What was intended to be a joyous, fruitful, intimate relationship between a man, a woman, and their God now became a battleground. And so it has been in every marriage since. As with every other area of our lives, deception is Satan's greatest instrument in achieving his destructive purposes for marriage. If he can get husbands and wives to believe and act on his lies, he will not succeed in putting them, uh, I'm sorry, he will succeed in putting them in bondage, stealing their joy and destroying 
their relationships. I don't think we often think about what happened in the Garden of Eden, uh, Garden of Eden that way. But it, it had huge, huge implications on even marriage today. Um, what I want to do is point out this right here, that deception, I read it, but I want to restate it here in our notes. Deception concerning God's intentions for marriage is one of Satan's greatest strategies to destroy marriages. If Satan can get us to believe certain lies about our relationships, specifically marriage, he can get a foothold in there to destroy that institution. He may not be able to destroy that person if they are a believer in Christ, but I'll tell you, he can get in there and destroy God's invention called marriage. So, what I want to do tonight is take a look in the time we have left at four destructive lies about marriage. Four lies that if we're not careful, and I don't care how old you are, how long you've been in a relationship, if you've never been in a marriage relationship, if you used to be in a marriage relationship, whatever your status is tonight, if you long for a marriage, if you long to be out of a marriage, if you long, whatever, wherever you are, we all are susceptible to believing lies about marriage. And so tonight I want to look at four destructive ones. Now, please understand, this will not be all of the lies that there are about marriage, okay? This is just a sampling. There's only four of them. There are probably hundreds of them out there that one could buy into. But we just want to look at four, I guess, more four categorical ones. Um, the first one is lie number one that we're going to look at is this. I have to have a spouse in order to be happy. You ever met someone who thought that way? Have you ever thought that way yourself? I've thought that way, obviously before marriage. I have to have a spouse in order to be happy. Now, this particular lie is a subtle distortion of truth. There, you see, there are some truths wrapped up in this lie. And that's what makes it a little more believable. It doesn't present itself as a lie. It is interlaced with some truths. What are some of those truths? Well, marriage is good and right, isn't it? I mean, the Bible speaks very highly of marriage. Okay, it speaks of honor within marriage. It speaks of man finding a wife and that being a good thing. Um, there, there is much positive given in Scripture about marriage. Marriage is good and right, isn't it? Um, Marriage is God's plan for most people. Well, the sheer numbers just tell you that. The sheer numbers throughout history tell you that marriage is God's plan for most people. Doesn't mean it's God's plan for all people, but because it's God's plan for most people, it can then open us up to a lie, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. Uh, and then the, the third truth that is wrapped up in this lie is this. There is great joy and blessing in a God-centered ma marriage. Uh, sure, we, can't, we cannot hide that fact. There is great joy and great blessing when God is the center of a marriage. But the danger comes in when you take each one of these truths and say, well, marriage is good and right, thus I must get married. Or you say, marriage is God's plan for most people, thus I have to get married. Or there is great joy and blessing in a God-centered marriage, so it must be that I have to get married. Be careful. What you're doing there is you are, you, you're making these things that are true exclusively personal, and they may not be. You see, the, the lie is this, that you need marriage in order to be happy. There's the core of the lie. Satan twists these truths that I just mentioned and maybe some others. We buy into the lies when we believe that the purpose of that marriage is to fulfill and make me happy. You see, the person who says, I must get married or I will never be happy, is the person who's bought into Satan's lies that says, you know what? Marriage is the source of happiness. That is a lie from hell. I'm sorry to be blunt, but marriage is not the source of happiness. Now, is marriage good and right? Sure. Is marriage God's plan for most people? Sure. Is there great joy and blessing in a God-centered marriage? Yes. But does that mean it's the source of our happiness? No. And if you treat it that way, you, you'll even mess up those three truths. 
if you treat marriage to be the source of happiness, I will tell you this, you won't be happy. You get what I'm saying? If you treat marriage as being the source of happiness, I promise you, you won't have a happy marriage. Because you, you will have misplaced the emphasis. There's a variation of this lie, and it's this. My spouse is supposed to make me happy. Maybe you've never heard someone verbalize that, but we, we, often, we often act that way. Your purpose, wife, or your purpose, husband, is to make me happy. And so when you don't do the things that I want you to do, or you don't think the way I want you to think, well, then I'm not happy and then something's wrong. You see, we, we are imposing our own feelings upon God's institution, and God never designed it to be that way. That's a lie. What is the truth? The truth is this. Our ultimate purpose in, in life, in marriage, in parenting, in church, in jobs, in the community, our ultimate purpose in life is to glorify God. Whether you are single, whether you are married, and even if your spouse doesn't do what you want them to do, your ultimate purpose in life as a believer in Jesus Christ is to glorify God. Having a spouse is not necessary for happiness. Or having a spouse who does and thinks and is the way you want them to do or think or be. That's not necessary for your and my happiness. But we treat it that way because we bought into lies that this is the source of happiness. That I must have marriage, I must have a spouse to be happy or I must have a spouse that is a certain way in order to be happy. And that is simply not true. You see, happiness is not found in any human relationship. Sure, is there blessing in human relationships? Absolutely. But happiness is not, is not originated from any human relationship. True joy can only be found in or through Christ. True joy can only be found in or through Christ. You see, what we're doing when we treat people or circumstances as the source of happiness, maybe for some time we, we ride some sort of happy wave, but then as it, with every other wave, it runs out. And we fall flat on our face because we were riding upon the wrong wave. The only wave of happiness that is legit is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only source of true joy is Jesus Christ. So I guess I must first ask you this, whether you're here in the auditorium or you're watching by live stream, are you in Christ? You see, it's impossible to do life God's way and thus have God's joy and happiness. It's impossible to have those things if you're not first in Christ, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior from sin. But I'll tell you this, even if you trust, Christ, even if you, you have accepted Christ as your Savior, there, there is possibility to, to turn your focus away from Christ and to begin believing lies about the source of happiness. So I have to ask you, are you resting upon Christ? Not only did you positionally uh, trust Christ to, to be saved, but are you practically, on a day-by-day -day basis, trusting Christ as the foundation of your joy? I want to give you three resetting truths. Three truths from God's word that can reset and maybe even kick some of these lies to the curb. Number one, God has promised to give us everything we need. Romans 8.32. Think about this. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. You see, we often doubt that we have everything we need from God. Well, if my circumstances were better than this, if I had this, then I would be happy. If I had a spouse, I would be happy. If my spouse only did this, then I would be happy. Or they would stop doing this, I would be happy. But God has promised to give us everything we need for life and godliness. God has promised to give us everything we need for true joy. And it only takes a glance at the cross to realize God saw our greatest need and gave us exactly what we needed to fulfill that need, eternal life 
through Jesus Christ. If he spared not his own son, but delivered his son for us, don't you think he'll give us what we need in our daily lives? I'm, I, I'll be frank with you. I, I'm up against challenges, just like you are. We all have, right in front of us, obstacles and walls that it doesn't look very easy to get through, around, or past. We have challenges. We have difficulties. We all have them. There's not one here who does not experience them. But I will tell you this. Today, God has promised to give you everything that you need. Don't you think? It says, if he didn't spare his son, but he gave him to die in your place, don't you think he'll give you everything he need, you need for today? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's a resetting truth. What about this? Contentment is not found in having what we think we need but in choosing to be satisfied with God's provision. Contentment is not found in, well, if I only had this, or if this were to happen, or, or whatever those scenarios are. Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Paul says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and on all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You see, with or without a spouse, I can do all things through Christ. With or without a spouse who does or is or thinks the way I want them to or be, I can do all things through Christ. You see, Christ is our source of success, not a spouse, not whatever the fill-in-the-blank issue is. What's the third resetting truth? Well, it's this. Insistence on having one's own way. You know, because there are a lot of people who will manipulate the circumstances. They will just fight and fight and fight for what they think they want or what they think they need. Insistence on one's way usually leads to heartache. I could have put this verse in here. A way of a man seems right in his own eyes, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Destruction comes when we insist upon our own way. So insistence on having one's own way usually leads to heartache while waiting on the Lord always gets his best. Isaiah 40 verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Man, I, I, what an image. I saw someone post on social media today. Um, they were posting some still shots of a bald eagle in flight, both before, during, and after the catch of a fish down in the water. And there were some magnificent shots. And if you, we, have, we have bald eagles we see every now and then around here. We see hawks and other birds of prey. Even I think I saw an osprey somewhere recently. I don't remember if it was here or somewhere else. But, but we, we have these birds of prey, and, and eagles specifically, and they are glorious to watch them soar through the air almost effortlessly. What an image we have here. They that wait upon the Lord shall have their strength renewed. Do you feel pretty weak right now? Maybe you do. I do. I'll just be honest with you. I'm, I'm in a weak state right now. Um, maybe you're going through a weak state right now. Wait on the Lord. Trust Him. Don't take it into your own hands. They shall... Mount up with wings as eagles, effortless, effortlessly fly through whatever the issues are. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What a promise. Just wait on the Lord. Look to the Lord. He's got the answer. It may or may not be what you're hoping it will be, but the Lord always has the answer. It may or may not be a spouse in your future. It may or may not be a change in your particular spouse. It may or may not be whatever it is that you think that you need. But I tell you, you wait on the Lord. He renews your strength. He helps you to effortlessly go right through those obstacles. He, he allows you to run and not be weary. He gives you the strength to not faint. First lie about marriage that we can often embrace is I must have a spouse in order to be happy. <clears throat> Wrong. 
I hope the sirens go off in your head if you find yourself thinking that way. A spouse is not going to make you happy. Because I'll tell you this. Your deficiencies before marriage remain deficient after marriage. You bring those with you. And so bringing a spouse into it only didn't bring someone else's issues into the marriage along with yours. And so you have a set of issues. Now they have a set of issues. And now you bring them together, you got a lot of issues. Now some of you are probably being like, probably thinking, Pastor, are you, are you a believer in marriage? Well, of course I'm a believer in marriage. I love being married. But I do also know that scripturally speaking, marriage is not the source of happiness. I'm looking in the face of some who have learned that the hard way. I have had in my office counseling situations of those who are in the midst of learning that the hard way. Because we buy into the lie that marriage is going to make me happy. No, Christ makes you happy. Marriage oftentimes is a byproduct of the blessings of God in one's life, but that's not the source of happiness. All right, that's the first one. I'm going to hurry along through the other three because I've spent a lot of time on that one. Number two, it is my responsibility to change my spouse. How many of you can think of at least one thing you want changed about your spouse? Don't raise your hand. I, I know. I, we, we all have them, okay? We, we, except, except me because my wife is perfect. Um, after that last statement a couple of sentences ago, I needed to redeem myself a bit. Um, we, we are good at finding fault in, in our marriages, right, in our spouses. And, and we, we know, I, I could come around to you and say, hey, what is one thing you wish were different about your spouse or you wish would change about them? And, and very likely most everyone in this room who is married can tell me at least one thing. That, that's just the breaks of living with a sinner, okay? Sinners come with sin and, and issues, right? So th they're there. But the lie comes in when you bring it up on your shoulders to change that spouse. You see, there's this instinct to fix our spouse. It seems irresistible, but I'll tell you, inevitably, it leads to frustration and conflict. You know why? Because you can't do it. I put a quote here from the book in your notes. I, you'll see a lot of brackets and parentheses in there because in order to make sense in our discussion, I needed to change some of the, the pronouns. In the context of marriage, this lie takes the focus off of a spouse's own needs and their own walk with the Lord, which they can do something about. Further, it places their focus on someone else's failures and needs, which they may be able to do very little, if anything, about. The fact is, they cannot change their spouse's or their children's heart. However, they can cooperate with the Holy Spirit in changing their own heart. We often have in our marriages the, the speck and log syndrome. You know that from Jesus' teaching, where there, there are people who say, hey, let me... Let me um, get that little piece of dust out of your eye. Let me fix your issue. Meanwhile, they're walking around with a two-by-four hanging out of their eye. And they're trying to get your, you're, you're trying to, you've got this big board hanging out of your face. And you're trying to get a little piece of dust off of someone else's. That's what it's like when we're trying to fix our spouse. Instead of focusing between me and the Holy Spirit on what he wants to do in me, I'm trying to fix them. It's not your responsibility. It's not even within the realm of your ability. Changing your spouse is a responsibility that God never intended you to have. It can lead to frustration and resentment to your spouse. It can also lead to resentment and frustration toward God. Well, God, why aren't you helping me to change them? Because God never put that on your shoulders to change them. That's God's job. That is his prerogative but by the way he he has given you if you're facing this situation in your marriage in some particular way god has given two powerful weapons for change that are hugely more effective than whining nagging or preaching he's given us two powerful weapons number one a godly life a godly life first peter three verses one through four likewise he wives 
be in subjection to your own husbands, that if they obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. What's the conversation, by the way? That's a word in our King James Version of the Bible that means um, lifestyle, your conduct. So by your conduct, you can win over toward the Lord your spouse. Through a godly life, it goes on to say, while they behold or gaze upon your chaste conversation, your, your, your controlled uh, lifestyle coupled with fear, fear of what? Fear of the Lord, right? A, 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 an awe and respect of the Lord. It goes on to say, basically what not to focus on, who's adorning or clothing or appearance. Let it not be that outward adoring of plating the hair and of wearing gold and of putting on of apparel. That doesn't change anything. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament. You want to put on something good that's going to be attractive and, and changing in your spouse or for, toward your spouse. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. All of that to say this, a godly life is huge in bringing change in a spouse. But the problem is most people are not patient enough to wait, on the, to wait on the Lord to do what he wants to do. They say, well, I've, I've been patient long enough. I've got to put my foot down. Well, who said you've been patient long enough? Did God say that or you say that? A godly life is hugely influential. But the second weapon God gives is prayer. Here we have the resource of appealing to a higher power to act in your spouse's life. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful or be anxious, worry for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Let me tell you what this verse does not say. It doesn't say, let your nagging be made known unto your spouse. Let your preaching be made known unto your spouse. It says, let your prayers be made known unto God. Bring your request to the Lord. Who can do something better than you could ever do it? God can. Listen, we, I was just having a conversation with someone before church, and, and it, was, it, it was really about some of the struggles that, that pastors can have sometimes. And, and, and I'll tell you this, one of the most encouraging and life-stabilizing truths that the Lord has ever helped me with is the fact that I can trust him to fight battles for me. That he can fight them much better than I could ever fight them. He can, I tell you, he knows how to wield a sword and make a very clean, appropriate cut. Whereas if I wield the sword, you know what I do? I leave a bloody mess. God is much better at fighting battles and orchestrating details than any one of us could ever think to be. Prayer. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Maybe tonight you just need to say, Lord, thank you for what you're going to do in my spouse's life. I don't know what it's going to be, but thank you. I know you got something in store. Lord, I'm trusting you to do this. It's far more effective for a spouse to appeal to the Lord to change their spouse than to exert pressure on them directly. I'll tell you, in life, pressure usually just breaks things. Right? I mean, you hold something breakable too tight, you, you break it, right? You, you push on something too hard, you break it. You crash into something too hard, you break it. You exert pressure in your relationships too hard, you bring breakage. But you trust God to do what only he can do, and it's much more influential. I need this kind of dependence, and you need this kind of dependence. We all need it. It's not your job to change your spouse. Don't believe that lie. Number three. Oh, brother. If I submit to my husband, I'll be miserable. I don't know if there's ever been a time in the history of mankind where submission within the God-ordained confines of marriage has been attacked as it is today. 
challenging, notice the notes here, challenging the God-ordained practice of submission was at the heart of Satan's temptation of Eve. So maybe it has been attacked. It's been attacked since day one. Can, can you just hear, can you hear Satan say this to Eve? Does, does God have the right to rule your life? I mean, it's yours, right? You can run your own life. You don't have to submit to anyone else's authority. Who is God to tell you you can't be like him? You know, Satan knows that if we could see the truth about biblical submission, which is one of the most liberating principles in all of God's word, Satan knows that if we, we could just see the truth about what God's form of submission looks like, we would joyfully embrace it. But the fact of the matter is, he cannot afford to let us choose the pathway of submission. For if we do, he is stripped of his authority and rendered powerless in our lives and in the lives of those we love. You see, submission, biblical submission, mind you, okay, is God's plan. And it's God's plan for God's work. It's God's plan for God's process. And it's God's plan for God's protection. What are some common lies about submission that make us push against it? Well, number one, the wife is inferior to the husband. That's a lie. In no way is the wife ever to be considered inferior to the husband. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that's the wife, according to knowledge. You know what that means, by the way? Get to know her, men. Get to know your wife. Don't win her and then leave her alone. You continue to pursue her. Man, I, sometimes I feel like the biggest hypocrite when, I still, when I'm teaching you guys. Because I'm like, you big dummy, you need that too. And, and you know, we, we all do. And, and men, don't stop pursuing your wife. Um, there's nothing less about her. There's more and more I need of her. There's more and more I need to get to know of her. Dwell with them according to knowledge, it says. Giving honor unto the wife. She's a gift. Honor her, men, as unto the weaker vessel. And that term weaker vessel has no inference of lesser value, just a different function. And as being, though, here's where the equality comes in, as being heirs together of the grace of life. You know, Men, you need the grace of God just as much as she does. You've got just as much issues as she has. There's no one better than the other person. The wife is never inferior to her husband. And the verse goes on, that your prayers be not hindered. I mean, it even has an effect on your prayer life, how you treat your wife. That's a lie to think that the wife is inferior to the husband. But here's another one. As the head of his wife... The husband is permitted to be harsh or dictatorial with his wife. Uh-uh. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. How do you do that? Well, it goes on to tell you. Keep reading. Even as Christ also loved the church, how did he do that? Gave, and he gave himself for it. So the husband is called to sacrifice for his wife, not to put his foot down and say, I'm the man of the house and you better do as I say. Nowhere does Scripture teach a dictatorial view of biblical man sh manhood in the house and in the home. That's just not, that's not biblical. Nowhere is, is the, the man permitted to be harsh. The Bible never, men, gives you an opportunity or leeway to be harsh with your wife. It's not there. Third lie. The wife is not to provide input or express her opinions to her husband. Survey says, <clears throat> not true. Genesis 2.18, and the Lord God said, I told you we'd come back to that help meet, right? It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That means a help that is suitable for him. That means a, a, a completer. She is your completer. I'll tell you, I really, I really wholeheartedly believe this because I've seen it, and then I also know God teaches it. There are many, many, many areas of life 
where I am much better at doing it with my wife than independent of her. Many, many areas. Man, she, she has a way of knowing what I'm thinking before I even finish what I'm saying. I tell you, she can even say what I'm thinking better than I can say it. It's because of that principle right there. When God brings a man and woman together, they complete one another. Those of you who know woodworking, you know what a dovetail joint is, right? You know where it's basically you have two pieces of wood that are kind of cut out like fingers, and, and there's a very, very strong bond in a dovetail joint when those two pieces of wood, often like old furniture, drawers, if you pull out, if you have an antique piece of furniture, you pull the drawer out, you might see in the back um, these, these finger joints, if you will. Um, what th- what th- that's what I like to think of when, when we're talking about how a man and woman come together. Where, where I'm void here, where I'm deficient, she often fits that like a glove and vice versa. So I need her opinions. I, I, I have no right to, to disregard what she's thinking and vice versa, okay? Another lie, fourth one. The husband is always, oh, I didn't mean to put this one in there. I thought I deleted this one. No, I'm just kidding. The husband's always right. That's a lie. As much as I would like to insist upon the fact that that is true, the husband is not always right. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 2, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. So is it possible that a husband doesn't obey the word? Well, the Bible gives that possibility right there. Um, they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, okay? So it's not the fact, it's not true that the husband's always right. You see, those are lies about subjection. I think that cause ladies often to, to push against subjection and say, no, I'm not submitting myself to that. Well, men, let's be biblical so that our wives can also biblically submit, okay? It, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. God's purpose for authority, including submission within the marriage, is to provide spiritual covering and protection. You see, this is God's plan. We've said this often. Life done God's way brings God's blessing. Is that what you said? Good. Good job. All right. Life done God's way brings God's blessing. God's order applies to even to marriage. There's an order. Man is to be head in the marriage. And, and, and as he biblically leads, a, a lady also is to submit. But how? As unto the Lord, and this is what we need to get to, you see, when we place ourselves under the spiritual covering of our authorities that God has placed in our lives, God protects us. Okay, now, I, I put in parentheses there, excluding extreme situations. Are there extreme, harmful situations that maybe a spouse needs to remove themselves f- from, at least for a time? Um, yeah, and, and that's to be talked about on an individual basis. That's not a con- that is not a condoning of divorce. I'm, I'm just saying, it, does there need to be a separation sometimes? That, yeah. Sometimes there's a very toxic or very hurt, harmful situation, and, and that's an individual thing. That is not what we're talking about here. But within the biblical construct and biblical confines of the marriage, when we place ourselves under the spiritual covering, co- covering of the authorities God has placed in our lives, God protects us. It's not the authorities that protect us. God does the protecting because it's God's plan. And remember, life done God's way brings God's blessing. The fundamental issue in relation to submission really comes down to my willingness to trust my God and to place myself under his authority. Why is it that for so long I as a pastor can still lead us to follow most of the regulations that have been given to us by our government. Is it because I trust our government? No. Is it because I think they're going to deliver us? No. But what I can do is biblically trust my God. And I can submit to my God by submitting to the authorities that he has ordained in my life, including my city life, okay, including how that affects our daily life. That's not popular amongst our, our crowd these days, but... It's true. Proverbs 21.1, 1, 
This is why I can trust my God. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. You do it God's way. God has a way of changing an impossible situation, even the heart of a husband, even the heart of a wife, even the heart of a government leader. God has a way of changing that. God is more powerful than that. So we can say this, our willingness to place ourselves under God-ordained authority is the greatest evidence of how big we believe God really is. There it is. So our willingness to submit to the authority God has placed in our lives is really a litmus test of how big we really believe our God is. Submission is not merely to the husband. It is actually given as unto the Lord. That's God's model. Okay? Number four, and we're done. And it's a short one, but an important one. Love doesn't require spoken words. That's a lie. Oh, well, she knows I love her. Don't do that, men. Don't do that. Love is more than just acts of service. Now, I get it. Is it loving to go to work every day and provide for your family and make sure that, that everything is there that needs to be there? Yeah, absolutely. That is loving. But that's only part of the picture. Love also includes expressions of affection. Two truth-motivated actions I want to give you. Practical. And I'm probably speaking more to men than ladies, but if it applies to you and you're a lady, please apply it. Speak more than you think you should. What I mean, what I mean by that is speak more loving words than you think you should. Oh, I've probably said enough. No, no say more. Because you probably haven't. We always give ourselves the bigger benefit of the doubt. No. Speak more than you think you should when it comes to expressions of affection. And if you have a kind of thought, say it. Right? If you have a kind of thought, express it. Don't just assume that the spouse hears it or knows it, I should say. They're not going to hear it if you don't say it. Except my wife, she reads my thoughts. She's that good. Uh, Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. It is healthy to speak expressions of love. It's healthy to say, I love you. It's healthy to say, I appreciate you. It's healthy to say, thank you. I'm going to give you an assignment. Man, woman, it doesn't matter. Boy, girl, teenager, old, young, doesn't matter. I want to encourage you with those whether you're married or whether you're not, you, if you're not married, you have people that you're close to and that you love. But here's your assignment for this next week. Your assignment is to say, I love you. Oh, men, say it, okay? I love you and speak one, good, one kind thing to them, your spouse or whoever it is, each day for the next week. It's not that hard of an assignment might be a habit has developed and it's harder to break, but it's not, this is not that hard of an assignment. I love you and one kind thing each day for the next seven days. Challenge accepted? Let's combat those lies. Let's combat the lies that we tend to believe. And they're subtle, right? They don't just, they don't just come in with sirens on saying, I'm a lie, I'm a lie, I'm a lie, come believe me. No, it just subtly creeps in. Let's combat them with God's truth. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we've had together to study your word and to attack even the, the lies that we tend to embrace when it comes to marriage. I pray that you'd meet each need of every heart here tonight. I pray that you'd dismiss us with your blessing. Lord, I pray that you would bring us back here uh, at your appointed time this next Sunday, ready to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.